Okay, in this lecture we're going to complete our exploration of chapter 8, which is titled Computer Reliability. And in particular we're going to start with section 8.8 .8 and finish the rest of the sections, so section 8.9 and 8.10 as well. So section 8.8 .8 is titled Computer Simulations, and in the previous three sections we explored accidents related to computerized systems in the areas of healthcare and transportation, but even systems kept behind the locked doors of a computer room can cause harm. And in particular, errors in computer simulations can result in poorly designed products, mediocre science, and bad policy decisions. So in this section, we're going to review our growing reliance on computer simulations for designing products understanding our world and even predicting the future. And we're going to describe ways in which computer modelers validate their simulations. So what are some uses of computer simulations? Well, computer simulation plays a key role in contemporary science and engineering. And there are many reasons why a scientist or engineer may not be able to perform an actual physical experiment. For one, it may be too expensive or time consuming or it may be unethical or just impossible to perform. Computer simulations can solve all of these problems and they've been used to design nuclear weapons, search for oil, create pharmaceuticals, and design safer, more fuel efficient cars. They've even been used to design consumer products such as disposable diapers. Some computer simulations model past events for example, when astrophysicists derive theories about the evolution of the universe, they can test them through computer simulations. A computer simulation has demonstrated that a gas disk around a young star can fragment into giant gas planets such as Jupiter. A second use of computer simulations is to understand the world around us. One of the first important uses of computer simulations was to aid in the exploration for oil. Drilling a single well costs millions of dollars, and most drillings result in dry wells that produce no revenue. But by using computer simulations, the process becomes much more predictable. Geologists lay out networks of microphones and set off explosive charges, and then computers can analyze the echoes received by the microphones to produce graphical representations of underground rock formations. And then analyzing these formations helps petroleum engineers select the most promising sites to drill. Computer simulations are also used to predict the future, such as in weather predictions. Those are based on computer simulations, and these predictions become particularly important when people are exposed to extreme weather conditions, such as floods, tornadoes, and hurricanes. Every computer simulation has an underlying mathematical model. Faster computers enable scientists and engineers to develop more sophisticated models, and then over time the quality of these models has improved. So how do we uh, go about validating simulations? Well, a computer simulation may produce erroneous results for two fundamentally different reasons. First, the program may have a bug in it, or the model upon which the program is based may be flawed. So verification is the process of determining if the computer program correctly implements the model, but validation is the process of determining if the model itself is an accurate representation of the real system. So in this section we're going to focus on the process of validation rather than verification. One way to validate a model is to make sure it duplicates the performance of the actual system. So for example, automobile and truck manufacturers create computer models of their products. They use these models then to see how well vehicles will perform in a variety of crash situations. Crashing an automobile on a computer is faster and much less expensive than crashing an actual car. So to validate their models, manufacturers compare the results of crashing an actual vehicle with the results predicted by the computer model. Validating a model that predicts the future can introduce new difficulties. 
If we are trying to predict tomorrow's weather, it is reasonable to validate the model by waiting until tomorrow, say, and then seeing how well the prediction held up. However, suppose you are a scientist using a global warming model to estimate what the climate will be like 50 years from now. You cannot validate this model by comparing its prediction with reality because you cannot afford to wait 50 years to see if the prediction comes true. So what you can do is some, a form of indirect validation. You can validate the model by using it to predict the present. Um, another way to validate a computer model is to see if it has credibility with experts and decision makers. Ultimately, a model is valuable only if it is believed by those who have the power to use its results to reach a conclusion or make a decision. And there, politics becomes relevant. Uh, so you might wonder then, what does it mean to predict the present? Well, figure 8.8 .8 illustrates a final way or a way, I should say, to validate a computer model by whether it predicts the present. So suppose you want to see how well your model predicts events 25 years into the future. Well, you have access to data, let's say, going back 75 years, so you can let the model use data at least 25 years old, but you do not let the model see any data collected in the past 25 years. The job of predicting the present given 25-year-old data is presumably just as hard as the job of predicting 25 years into the future given present data. So the advantage of predicting the present is that you can use current data to validate the model and then extrapolate to the reliability or the validity of any future predictions. Okay, section 8.9 is titled Software Engineering. And the field of software engineering grew out of a growing awareness of a software crisis. So what that, when that started to become obvious was in the 1960s when computer architects took advantage of commercial integrated circuits to design much more powerful mainframe computers. And then these computers could execute much larger programs than their predecessors. So programmers responded by designing powerful new operating systems and applications. Unfortunately, their programming efforts were plagued by problems. For example, the typical new software system was delivered behind schedule, cost more than expected, did not perform as specified, contained many bugs, and was too hard to modify. The informal ad hoc methods of programming that worked fine for early software systems began to break down when these systems reached a certain level of complexity. So software engineering is an engineering discipline focused on the production of software as well as the development of tools, methodologies, and theories supporting software production. Software engineers follow a four-step process to develop a software product. Uh, the first step in the process is specification or defining the functions to be performed by the software. Step two in the process is development or producing the software that meets the specifications. Step three is validation where the software is tested. And step four is evolution where you modify the software to meet the changing needs of the customer. So let's talk about specifications since it's step one. Uh, the process of specification focuses on determining the requirements of the system and the constraints under which it must operate. Software engineers communicate with the intended users of the system to determine what their needs are and they must decide if the software system is feasible given the budget and the schedule requirements of the customer. If a piece of software is going to replace an existing process then, then the software engineers study the current process to help them understand the functions the software must perform. The software engineers may develop prototypes of their user interface to confirm that the system will meet the user's needs, and the specification process results in a high-level statement of requirements and perhaps a mock-up of the user interface that the users can approve. Then the software engineers also produce a low-level requirements statement that provides the details needed by those who are going to actually implement the software. All right, and step two is development. So during the development phase, the software engineers produce a working software system 
that matches the specifications. The first design is based on a high-level abstract view of the system. The process of developing the high-level design reveals ambiguities, omissions, or outright errors in the specification stage. And then when these mistakes are discovered, the specification must be amended. And fixing mistakes is quicker and less expensive when the design is still at this higher, more abstract level compared to the maintenance phase. Um, but gradually, the software engineers add levels of detail to the design. And as this is done, the various components of the system become clear. And designers pay particular attention to ensure the interfaces between each component are clearly spelled out and then they'll choose the algorithms to be performed and data structures to be manipulated. Since the emergence of software engineering as a discipline, a variety of structured design methodologies have been developed. And these design methodologies results in the creation of large amounts of design documentation in the form of visual diagrams. And many organizations use computer-assisted software engineering or CASE tools to support the process of developing and documenting an ever more detailed design. Uh, another noteworthy improvement in software engineering methodologies is object-oriented design. So in traditional design, the software system is viewed as a group of functions manipulating a set of shared data structures. But in an object-oriented design, the software system is seen as a group of objects passing messages to each other. And then each object has its own state and manipulates its own data based on the messages it receives. And of course, uh, object-oriented systems have several advantages over systems constructed in a more traditional way. So number first, one uh, advantage is because each object is associated with a particular component of the system, object-oriented designs can be easier to understand. The second benefit is because each object hides its state in private data from other objects, other objects cannot accidentally modify its data items. And third, because objects are independent of each other, it is much easier to reuse components of an object-oriented system. A single object definition created for one software system can be copied and inserted into a new software system without bringing along other unnecessary objects. And when the design has reached a great enough level of detail, software engineers write the actual computer programs implementing the software system. And many different programming languages exist, and each language has its strengths and weaknesses, but programmers usually implement object-oriented systems using an object-oriented programming language such, such as C++, Java, or C Sharp. All right, phase three is about validation. So the purpose of validation, or what's just also called testing, is to ensure the software satisfies the specification and meets the needs of the user. In some companies, testing is an assignment given to newly hired software engin engineers who soon move on to design work after pr proving their worth. However, good testing requires a great deal of technical skill and some organizations promote testing as a career path. Testing software is much harder than testing other engineered artifacts, such as bridges, as we know how to construct scale models that we can use to validate our designs. And to determine how much weight a model bridge can carry, we can test its response to various loads and the stresses and strains on the members and the deflection of the span change gradually as we add weight, uh, allowing us to experiment with a manageable number of different loading scenarios. And then engineers can extrapolate from the data they collect to generate predictions regarding the capabilities of a full-scale bridge. And by increasing the size of various components, they can add a substantial margin of error to ensure the completed bridge will not fail. But a computer program is not at all like a bridge in this sense, because testing a program with a small problem can reveal the existence of bugs, but it cannot prove that the program will work 
when it has fed a much larger problem. The response of a computer program to nearly identical data sets may not even be continuous. Instead, programs that appear to be working just fine may fail when only a single parameter is changed by a small amount. Yet programmers cannot exhaustively test programs because even small programs have a virtually infinite number of different inputs and since exhaustive testing is impossible, programs can never be completely tested. Uh, software testers strive to put together suites of test cases that exercise all the capabilities of the component or system being validated. And to reduce the complexity of validating a large software program, testing is usually performed in stages. So in the first stage of testing, each individual module of the system is tested independently. It's easier to isolate and fix the causes of errors when the numbers of lines of code is relatively small. And then after each module has been debugged, modules are combined into larger subsystems for testing. And eventually all the subsystems are combined in the complete system. And when an error is detected and a bug is fixed in a particular module, all the test cases related to the module should be repeated to see if the change that fixed one bug accidentally introduced another bug. <clears throat> there is evidence that the field of software engineering is becoming more mature. The Standish group regularly tracks thousands of IT projects and as recently as 1994 about one-third of all software projects were canceled before completion. About one half of the projects were completed but had time or cost overruns that were often quite large. Only about one sixth of the projects were completed on time and on budget, and even in these cases, the completed systems often had fewer features than originally planned. And then another survey by the Standish Group in 2009 showed that the probability of a software project being completed on time and on budget had doubled to about one in three. And only about one quarter of the software projects surveyed were canceled, slightly less than half of the projects were late or over budget, but the time and cost overruns were not as large as in the first survey. So overall, the ability of companies to produce software on time and on budget improved over this 15 year period. say something about gender bias. When a profession is dominated by men, unconscious gender bias can affect important design decisions. So for example, in the United States, the leading cause of fetal death due to maternal trauma is automobile accidents. Seatbelts don't protect pregnant women and their unborn children properly. So when crash test dummies are designed to model the average adult male pregnant women as well as men significantly larger or smaller than average may suffer harm. And research shows that women and men, to have, men tend to have different approaches to writing and debugging software as well, and they use programming tools differently. Many products are designed with the intention of being gender neutral, appealing to both women and men, but if everyone on the team is a man, what may they unconsciously overlook? Um, even if there are some women on the team, they may not feel free to express themselves. And some companies have a culture that encourages team members to brainstorm ideas and vote on which ones to implement. Voting tends to suppress minority views. And many women are reluctant to waste political capital by proposing or speaking up for ideas that they believe will just get voted down anyway. And moreover, many decisions related to the final product are made informally and under time pressure. And if nearly all of the developers are men, the female perspective may not be heard. One way to address the problem of gender bias in software product development is to increase the percentage of women actively engaged in the process. Currently, about three quarters of IT jobs are held by men. So what can be done to increase the number of women in software development and leadership positions? Well, job postings are a practical place to start. In the United States, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal for job advertisements to indicate a preference for male or female 
applicants, thank God. Uh, however, there is evidence that people creating job advertisements in male-dominated fields continue to convey either subtly or unconsciously the gender of the ideal candidate. And women are less likely to apply for a position when the advertisement contains a lot of masculine themed words such as active, adventurous, aggressive, ambitious, analytical, assertive, challenging, competitive, decisive, independent, leader, outspoken, and self-reliant. Interestingly though, men are just as likely to apply for a position when the advertisement contains a lot of feminine themed words such as committed, compassionate, connected, cooperative, dependable, empathetic, honest, interpersonal, kind, loyal, polite, responsible, and trusting. So simply drawing women into software organizations will not solve the problem unless the culture of these organizations also changes. And more than half of women who enter the tech field drop out by mid-career. They tend to be driven out by hostile work environments and extreme job pressures making women feel isolated and, and lacking mentors. And they t so they tend to encounter, women tend to encounter these macho cultures and two-thirds of them experience sexual, two-thirds of them experience sexual harassment. Uh, Lauren Weinstein, a, a man with more than 40 years of experience in the tech industry says, we see these stories, you know, why aren't there more women in computer science and engineering? And there's all these complicated answers like, School advisors don't have them take math and physics, and it's probably true, but I think there's probably a simpler reason, which is these guys are just jerks, and women know it. And then there's also bias in training sets for artificial intelligence systems. So when a data set used to train an artificial intelligence system is biased, the performance of the system across a diverse population can vary dramatically. In a data set widely used to train facial recognition, recognition systems, about 75% of the faces are male and more than 80% of the faces are white. Uh, a researcher at MIT's Media Lab found that the facial recognition systems of Microsoft, IBM, and Face++ misidentified the gender of fair-skinned males only 1% of the time while they misidentified the gender of darker skinned females up to 35% of the time. Google Photos, released in 2015, employs machine learning to group photos automatically based on their contents, which allows users to search their image collections. Soon after the service began, Jackie Alcine, a 20-year-old black computer programmer, tweeted that Google Photos had mislabeled him and a black friend as gorillas in photos he had posted. Google quickly responded to the tweet by issuing an apology and censoring the words gorilla, chimp, chimpanzee, and monkey from Google Photos searches and image tags until the problem could be fixed. Three years later, the terms were still being blocked and a Google spokesperson told Wired Magazine that the image labeling technology was still nowhere near perfect. Uh, in two important collections of photos used by machine learning algorithms, most images of cooking, washing, and shopping show women, and most images of coaching and shooting show men. You know, but when you think about where the images come from, it's not surprising that the images tend to show people in traditional roles However, you might be surprised to learn that machine learning systems can amplify biases. So one study showed that while a training set of photos had women in 67% of the photos illustrating cooking, the trained system identified the person in 84% of the cooking photos as a woman. Okay, so final section here, section 8.10. It's titled Software Warranties and Vendor Liability. Um, as mentioned earlier, Levison and Turner state that there is always another software bug. Um, if perfect software is impossible, what should the rights of consumers be to get compensation when programs malfunction? So in this section, we're going to survey the software warranties offered by some software manufacturers, how these warranties have held up in court, and 
the variety of ways software vendors may be held liable for software defects. In the United States, contracts and warranties are primarily governed by the states rather than the federal government, and the Uniform Commercial Code, or the UCC, represents an attempt to harmonize laws governing commercial transactions across the 50 states. Nearly every state has adopted the UCC with only minor variations. Traditional consumer software was often called shrink wrap software because of the plastic wrap surrounding the box containing the software and manuals. In the early years of personal computers, consumer software manufacturers provided no warranty for their products. Purchasers had to accept shrink wrap software as is. <clears throat> but today many software manufacturers provide a replacement or money back guarantee if the program fails, but none accept liability for harm caused by use of software. So how can software manufacturers get away with disclaiming any warranties on what they have sold? Uh, well, it's not clear that they can, and if the software is mass marketed or if it is included in a sale of software, it is likely to be considered a good by a court of law. And the damages and warranty provisions of the UCC often apply to the sale of goods, despite what the warranties may say. An early court case, uh, the Step Saver Data Systems versus Weiss Technology and the Software Link, seemed to affirm the notion that software manufacturers could be held responsible for defective programs, despite what they put in their warranties. However, two later cases seem to indicate the opposite. So in ProCD versus Zeidenberg, the court ruled that the customer could be bound to the license agreement even if the license agreement does not appear on the outside of the shrink wrap box. And then in Mortensen versus Timberline software, that court case showed that a warranty disclaiming the manufacturer's liability could hold up in court. Okay, so the question that's relevant then is, should software be considered a product? Well, as we have seen when software is judged to be a good, the provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code regarding damages and warranty can apply. Um, if software were to be considered a product, then the theory of strict liability would apply to the software manufacturer. Now, so what's that? Well, according to the theory of strict liability, the manufacturer is liable for personal injury or property damage caused by a product when it is being used in a reasonable way. Because the theory of strict liability focuses on personal injury and property damage, but not economic loss, the primary impact of treating software as a product would be in those situations where software is part of an embedded system such as an automobile. So to date, courts in the United States have resisted treating software as a product subject to the theory of strict liability. Uh, why is that? Well, in part, it's because a software controlled device may cause harm through no fault of the programmer. Consider, for example, the development of a new software controlled device for a medical tr treatment. So even practicing physicians may have differences of opinion about the best treatment option for a particular patient so how then can the company developing the device that delivers the treatment guarantee that the treatment will never hurt a patient? Well, is it reasonable to put all the liability on the manufacturer when others, such as hospital administrators, physicians, and technicians may share some of the responsibility? Well, the theory of strict liability would seem to put too much liability on the software manufacturer in cases like this 